Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain in which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Think in 
harmony and be agreeable. The Corinthians are now on their own as Paul leaves them with these careful instructions on how to live together as the body of Christ. Paul concludes his letter knowing that if the Corinthians follow his advice, not only will they be better off, but he will receive fewer letters of complaint and he'll have to deal with a lot less strife during his future visits. It is now up to these young Christians to take Paul's instructions to heart as they embark on this new challenge of forming community in the name of Jesus Christ. And in forming community, one thing can often impact another. For instance, a man went to a dinner party and he knocked over his glass of wine. So the woman next to him sprinkled salt on the same tablecloth. And then the man tossed some of the salt over his shoulder to ward off some bad luck. Well, the salt hit the server in the eyes. So the server rubbed his eyes and happened to drop a platter of chicken on the floor. And so the family dog began devouring the chicken and then choked on the chicken bone. And so the son of the house tried to loosen the chicken bone from this dog's throat and the dog bit the boy's finger the boy's finger had to be amputated and sort of round and round and round the other <laughs> Ever feel as though you have been going round and round in circles? Well, there might be a reason for that. More and more cities are choosing a new approach to traffic control. It is inspired by our brothers and sisters across the ocean and city planners are planning on replacing traditional traffic signals with a more efficient roundabout. Now last month I had to go to a meeting at Pine Ridge Presbyterian Church. And I got caught in one of those things. And I went round and round around trying to find my way out to the street I needed so I could get back here. Proponents tout them as if they're the answer to the modern day scourge of traffic congestion and big city growth. Naysayers avoid them like the plague, sometimes driving miles out of their way to avoid the confusion of this never-ending parade of a circle of cars. Roundabouts, love them or hate them, we're probably going to see more of them. These roundabouts are supposed to help with traffic. They're supposed to do away with those long lines and intersections while drivers grip their steering wheels, grimly waiting for a green line. Instead of drivers stopping and starting according to the changing lights, Roundabouts encourage traffic to keep moving in a smooth pattern. Traffic engineers have discovered that roundabouts, or rotaries as we call them here in the United States, are safer. They cause less air and noise pollution. They're more efficient than the usual stop and go traffic experienced at traditional intersections. When accidents occur, they're less severe because you're creeping along like a little snail going round and around in a circle instead of barreling through an intersection trying to be alive. Experts conclude that taking away the need, or really the temptation, to beat the red light has led to slower speeds and thus safer driving. And the emphasis of roundabout seems to be on cooperation rather than competition. Oh, and of course, environmentalists, they're also jumping on the roundabout bandwagon. In an age when any glimpse of green or nature is appreciated, roundabouts are often beautifully landscaped. They provide drivers with this attractive scenery with landmarks. 
and drivers often appreciate that added beauty by giving themselves more time to decide on a route or to figure which place your road comes off that roundabout. More than one driver has taken advantage of the forgiving nature of roundabouts or rotaries. When unsure which road to take, like I did, you just keep going round and round, enjoying the flowers and enjoying the little fountain. Why not enjoy them while you go one more time? If roundabouts had existed in the first century, I think Paul might have used them as an example for ordering church life. Just as with church life today, some people would enthusiastically take on the challenge of a new idea, while others would moan in chorus, but we've never done it that way before. Yet Rotaries can teach us a lesson about how to survive in community. In Rotaries, as in churches, people need to pay attention to one another in order to get along. And the challenge is to instruct drivers in this new, improved way of working with one another. And it takes a certain amount of education and patience and goodwill on the part of all concerned. But once drivers are accustomed to the new traffic circle, improved efficiency and safety result, the ensuing traffic patterns could be instructed to anyone attempting to live and work together. Rabbi Harold Kushner gives us his take on what it means to come out into a world needing love and kindness. He wrote this. There's a story told of a man who died after having led a thoroughly selfish and moral life. And moments later, he found himself in a world of bright sunlight, soft music and figures all dressed in white. And he said, boy, I never expected this. I never expected this. I guess God has a soft spot in his heart for a clever rascal like me after all. And he turned to a figure in a white robe and said, hey, buddy, I've got something to celebrate. Can I take you out for a steak dinner? And the figure answered, oh, we don't have any of that around here. And the guy said, no steak? You're kidding. Well, then how about a game of cards? A little pinochle, a little draw poker, you name it. And the guy in white said, oh, I'm sorry, but we don't gamble here either. And then the man asked, well, what do you do all day long? And the man in white said, well, we read the Psalms a lot. There's a Bible class every morning. There's a prayer circle every afternoon. The guy said, Psalms? Bible study all day long? Boy, I tell you, heaven isn't what it's cracked up to be. At which point the figure in white smiled and said, Oh, I see you don't understand. We're in heaven. You're in hell. <laughs> Heaven, the story suggests, is how to learn to do and enjoy the things that make us human, <clears throat> the things that only human beings can do. And by contrast, the worst kind of hell I can imagine is not fire and brimstone and little red figures with pitchforks. The worst hell is the realization that you could have been a real human being and now it's too late. You could have known the satisfaction of caring for another person. You could have known the satisfaction of being generous and truthful and loyal, of having developed your mind and your heart, of controlling your instincts instead of letting them control you. And we never did it. No one can argue with the vision Paul paints for his young church. Every intentional community desires to be successful and to live in peace with one another. The challenge is more in the process. 
the challenge is in the process. One wonders if the readers of Paul's letter looked on the back side of the parchment to search for some further instructions or, or some additional insights. The early Corinthians might have wondered, is that it? Is that it? Are there no more details to be given? And the questions abound. Now that we have the goal of agreeing with one another and living in peace, just how do we get there? How do we get there? How do we obtain that ideal balance of working and serving and believing while living in harmony with one another? Is it possible to just decide to live in peace? Has the world experienced millennia of wars and chaos only because of lack of will? Can one wake up in the morning and simply choose to be agreeable and to get along with others in the community? Or is it some concerted effort? Is some concerted effort necessary? Does it require sacrificing strong opinions? Must one constantly bite one's lip, lest disagreements arise to threaten the status quo? A Texas rancher bought ten ranches, and he put them together to form one giant spread. And his friend asked him the name of his new mega ranch, and he replied, it's called the Circle Q, Rambling Brook, Double Bar, Broken Circle, Crooked Creek, Golden Horseshoe, Lazy Bee, Bent Arrow, Sleepy Tea, Triple O Ranch. Wow, his friend said. Wow, I bet you have a lot of cattle. And the rancher said, well, not really. Many of them have a hard time being tagged my ranch's name. <laughs> when differing views and arguments crop up, what then? What then? It's a rare pastor who has not experienced church conflict. Churches are filled with opinionated, deeply caring, thoughtful, and sometimes overly sensitive human beings. Church gatherings can be very much like extended family mustered together for the holidays. It can be a messy mixture of joy and jealousy, creativity, and chaos. People can hurt each other, sometimes intentionally. Sometimes people don't realize their brand new idea seems to relegate beloved traditions to the dustbin. Small misunderstandings can evolve into virtual standoffs in which people aren't talking or agreeing, and things certainly aren't being done the Presbyterian decent and in order. No matter what Paul says, when family members are at odds with one another, the last thing they may desire is to be greeted with signs of Christ's peace. Paul can be asked if that activity is a requirement, or can community members opt out and wait for peace to once again prevail? A conductor of one of the nation's great symphonies was asked to name the instrument he thought was the most difficult to play. And after thinking the question over, he replied, second fiddle. I get plenty of first violinists, but to find one who can play second fiddle with enthusiasm is often a problem. And if we have no second fiddles, there's no harmony. Even in a short form of a benediction, Paul manages to proper wisdom that families, churches, work groups, clubs, and organizations everywhere can use. He emphasizes what's important. What's important? Let's all pull 
together. Let's be mindful of one another. Let's consider how to wrestle with the conflicts that will inevitably occur. Arguments, misunderstandings, jealousies, whenever two or three gather in the name of Jesus or for any other purpose. Living in community is much like driving on a busy, crowded highway. Paul presents some rules for these roads. At times, it will be necessary to yield, to slow down, to use extreme caution. Just like careful drivers, we are urged to keep our eyes on the road, to not allow ourselves to become distracted by multiple influences, and to pay attention to people who are also on the journey. Paul's instructions could be compared to a useful driving manual. Perhaps Paul's benediction could be reworded with our roundabout journey to keep that roundabout journey in mind. It might sound something like this. Farewell, brothers and sisters. Remember that we are all traveling in the same direction, although at differing speeds. At times, a fellow traveler may need to exit conversation, the project, life itself, before you do. Trust each other enough to allow that freedom. Keep your eyes on the road. Wish people well in their travels. Don't be so focused on your destination that you forget to enjoy the scenery along the way. Your life is truly a round and round and round we go process. As we continue in our roundabout journeys, let's endeavor to agree on the general direction we're traveling. We can work through our differences. At times we may bump into one another, but because we are all traveling together, we can handle those collisions easily. Acknowledge and be aware of the differences that exist. But celebrate the larger agreements that we share. Roundabouts. A vision of God's people traveling separately, yet together toward a shared destination. With goodwill and God's grace. We can journey on this road together.